Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad you're joining us either in person, online, or by video today. My name is Pastor Jim, and today we're going to continue our series in core discipleship and talk about one of the most I don't want to say simple, one of the easiest conversations Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He gave the great commandment in answer to a question, and it was a simple question. Which of the commandments is the greatest, was the question. They were trying to trick him into answering that question so that they could criticize him or arrest him or convict him of something, of sacrilege or something. Um, and he turned it around, as Jesus often did. And so we're going to talk about that conversation a little bit and what that means for us today. Um, I'm not sure I have any other announcements other than our Meals with a Message on Wednesdays is God is blessing that in lots of ways. And if you're not attending on Wednesdays, you should come and try it. Um, it's been, and it's not just about number of people, which has been increasing each week. It's about what is happening and what the questions that are raised, the discussion that's going on, uh, the activities that the kids are doing. Those are all blessings from God. And I think we take some of those things for granted at times because we expect them. We expect that to happen. But it's happening. Um, so come and join us on Wednesday um, if you can. And uh, join, join the church family in that event. Meal and a message. M-M-W-A-M. -M, Midweek meal with a message. Um, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. How is everyone doing today? Ho hopefully you all get to enjoy the nice weather today. It's a good fall day. So hopefully you can enjoy that with your family and friends. So today's call to worship. Praise our Lord, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Please join me in singing our opening hymn as we stand together, if you're able. Be thou my vision.
before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us. Let, us ox, let, let all around us be peace. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ under our feet, Christ within us, Christ over us. Let all of us be Christ. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all today and always. Please extend the peace to those around you. Or if you'd like to get up and shake hands, you're welcome to do that as well. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Our patient Lord knows how easy it is for us to whine and complain bitterly about all things in our lives that are difficult. We focus on them as though we were the only things that ever happened to us, forgetting the many blessings that God has given to us and opportunities he gives us to serve him. Let us all take a few moments to silently confess our failures and express our gratitude for God's Blessings and opportunities. Turn once again to the Lord, for you're beloved of God and have been given many blessings. Rejoice in God's love for you. In Christ, we are forgiven. Please stand and join me in singing, Praise the Lord, the Almighty. Please be seated, boys and girls. It's time for a message from Mary Snow. That's not working. Oh, sorry about that. You should have teaching. Okay. All right. So, the question for today What are you really good at? What's something in life that you're really, really good at? Sports. Sports. I like it. Math. Math. Nice. Go ahead. Being annoying to my siblings. Mm. Great. That's going to be an easy one to work with right there. Okay. <laughs> that one comes from me. Praise the Lord. So, do you know what a commandment is? What's a commandment? Go ahead. Um, it's basically like... Someone telling you to do something? Someone telling you to do something. Excellent. That's actually a really, really good answer. Thank you. So in MWM, which is message with a meal on Wednesdays, we had to be able to, on the spot, come up with 10 of the commandments. Do you guys know any of them? Uh, you don't know a single commandment. You know he does. I know he does. Go ahead. One. 
You shall not steal. Ooh, good one. That's right. A lot of the commandments are things you're not supposed to do. So I'm glad you said that. No, put your hand on that. Now it's my turn. I'm glad you know every single one. Catholic schoolboy. I think it's a class. Anyway, a commandment is a rule or an order or a command. Somebody telling you to do something. A lot of them are telling you what not to do, like not steal. But there's one. Somebody went to Jesus and said, what is the most important of all the commandments? Which one's the most important? And AJ thinks he knows it through my peripheral vision. So go ahead, say it. Um, worship God in public. Very interesting. That is not a commandment, just so everyone knows. It's not a commandment, but I, I like your interpretation of the words you thought you heard. I'll give you guys another chance. Do you know what God said is the very most? No, God didn't say it. Jesus said it out loud in words. What is the very most important commandment? Do you think you know? Okay, so this is the way, I'm not giving you another shot. This is the way I see it and know it. I look right there in the invisible seat where Miss Dawn is not right now. And I picture VBS in this cool song. You're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, my favorite part, your strength, and your mind. Now go over there and pick up my props. Everyone, there's three props. I figured there'd be three of you. There you go. Okay, Dresden, you can't take two. You each get one. There you go. Now stand up and show the people. Stand up, Tyler. Come on, sports boy. There we go. So check these out. When I see God's words, I, I see them in a tangible way. So what do you do with that? A strength. So when I think what you're strong at, most of the time we think of exercise. Pastor Jim riding his bicycle in North Park makes him super strong and whatnot. An athlete going, okay, you can sit down. You stand up, though, and you stay there. Put your arms way above your head, in fact. Now, strength in our eyes looks like something. Maybe it looks like Working out in the gym, that's what you think of as strength. But strength is what you are good at. If you are good at something, you're supposed to do it for God. The natural talent he put inside you, he wants you to do it with him always there right beside you. To remember he's there. To not just hit that awesome baseball and think, I am amazing. But to think, God is amazing for helping me do this. Now, how can I do it for him? But not just in baseball, in math. Sometimes strength looks like one thing, but look at this crazy apparatus. We stand still and hold it tight for me. Okay, I love you. Hold it like this, just like that, and hold it tight so I can pull. Thank you. This is a resistance bar. My strength is slightly resistant. That's why I like to use this as an example. I could grab both sides. Thank you. So this, I, I really don't want you to pull. I could hurt people with this. Thank you. So it's got all these bands and all these bars on it. So you can pick your different level of strength. God makes you stronger along the way, all the time in what you're good at. Go ahead and sit back down. And if you're not good at something, he finds a way to put things with you to help you be stronger. But the reason why he wants to do it is for everybody, for him to give everybody glory through him. Close your eyes, fold your hands. Dear Lord, thank you for your glory. Thank you for the strength that you put inside us. Lord, sometimes we don't use the right words and don't put them in the right order, but you give us strength. You give us so many things that we can come together as a family. Help us to remember that we are to keep you in mind with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strength, and with all our loves. And at the very end, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Because even Jesus couldn't name one. He named two. Amen. Good job. Thank you. You can throw those back under. Pretty please. Gracious Lord, like Nicodemus, 
We come to the word with many questions, like the Pharisees. We, we can be captive by correctness, intent on right answers as we turn to your word. Spirit of God, do not let our desire for information dominate our need for transformation. Let us hear the word and be moved to gather faith and obedience. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing our sermon hymn, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 119, 1 through 8. You can find that in the Pew Bibles. Um, my version is going to be from the NIV version, so it may be a little bit different than what's in our Pew Bibles. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statues and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down the precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. The Shema, there's a word that most of us don't know. The Shema is the basic confession of the Jewish people. It's a confession of faith. And it's their pledge of allegiance, if you will, to God. The word Shema comes from the Hebrew word, which means to hear. And the confession of faith begins with those words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The Shema is found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, verses 4 and 5, actually. And Jesus quotes this passage in our New Testament reading today. He quotes it word for word. There was a rabbi by the name of Shraga Simmons who wrote about the Shema, and he wrote this. It is said upon arising in the morning and upon going to sleep at night, it is said when praising God and when beseeching him. It is the first prayer that a Jewish child is taught to say. It is the last words a Jew says prior to death. We recite the Shema when preparing to read the Torah on Sabbaths and festivals, and we recite Shema at the end of the holiest day of Yom Kippur. So the Shema is well known in the Old Testament and within the Jewish people's communities of faith. 
It's a daily reminder that there is one and one only God, and they were to serve him alone. Christ, quoting this passage today, says that the greatest commandment is to love God with all that we are and all that we have. As Mary mentioned, heart, soul, mind, strength, emotions, life, possessions, service. In other words, we're to love God with our whole being. Pretty simple words, harder to live. This is God's vision for us, though, as followers of Christ, as his people. So let's read together from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40, this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Hear God's word. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. May God bless our hearing of his word today. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1995, a movie that was very popular came out called Mr. Holland's Opus. Anybody see, have you, anybody seen the Mr. Holland's Opus? Yeah, it was very popular. Glenn Holland, was a musician and a composer who takes a te teaching job to pay the rent. While in his spare time, he can strive to achieve his one real goal of writing and composing a piece of music that would be unforgettable. That was his goal. Mr. Holland tells his students in one scene the following words. Playing music is supposed to be fun. It's about the heart. It's about feelings. It's about moving people and something beautiful. And it's not about notes on a page. I can teach you notes on a page. I can't teach you that other stuff. Friends, loving God is exactly like that other stuff and should be more than that other stuff. The truth is that loving God is not just about playing notes on a page. The religious leaders that Jesus was talking to could all read notes on a page. In fact, they had gone so far as to document 613 commandments in the law. 248 of them were positive, 365 of them were negative. Then they took it a few steps further because they knew that no person could ever hope to know and fully obey all 16, 613 of these commandments. So they tried to make it easier for themselves by dividing the commandments into heavy or important commandments and light or unimportant commandments. A person could major on the heavy commandments and not worry too much about the trivial ones. It was all about playing the notes on a page and doing the right thing so God won't get mad. That's how they thought. That's what they believed. Jesus comes along and points out that this is not loving God, but rather loving religion. Christ did not die to establish a religion. He died so we could have a relationship with God himself. Our response in that relationship is what Jesus is talking about today. 
to love, worship, and obey him with all that we are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the vision for us. Another way to describe this vision is found in our own Westminster Confession, where it gives the chief end or purpose of mankind or humankind. The chief end of man, it says, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's a pretty simple statement. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. How's that working out for you? What did Mr. Holland say? Is it any fun? Following God should be fun. Why? Because it's about heart, feelings, and touching people's lives, our Lord and Savior, and being alive in him. That should be fun. Every day, it should be fun. It's about being a people involved in a passionate relationship with the God of the universe. Our creative God, our creator God, wants us to glorify him and enjoy him forever, for all of eternity. That is his vision for us, for every one of us. To use the movie Mr. Holland's Opus one more time as an analogy, I promise, the notes on the page are still important and useful for us. We don't just throw the notes on the page away. Whether we are playing music on an instrument or living out our core discipleship to Christ, the notes on the page prepare us, they strengthen us, and they even motivate us because God's vision for us includes the Holy Spirit. He promised that. As a musician, the notes on a page are the music we are following and playing. As a disciple of Christ, the notes on the page are found in God's word, prayer, and other places, many other places. God, through the Holy Spirit, guides us, corrects us, strengthens us, and transforms us. You and I can learn, practice, and utilize the notes on a page to make God's vision our own. That vision is living into core discipleship for Christ or of Christ. This greatest commandment that Jesus gives us essentially says, love God and love others. Those are simplified words. Love God and love others. So what does it mean to love God? Let's start there. What does it mean to love others? Let's start there. And begin with the word love. What the word love means today is sometimes confusing to people, to many people. So how do we define it? How do we make it specific? In answer to my questions, I discovered the results of a question and answer session held by a group of professional people with a bunch of four to eight year olds, okay? Where they asked the four to eight year olds, what does love mean? Simple, what does love mean? Some of the answers I selected will both amuse you and probably surprise you. Carl, age five, says, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving lotion and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> Elaine, age five, says, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. Mary Ann, age four, says, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day long. Tommy, age six, says, love is a little old man and a little old woman who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Bobby, age five, said this, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. That's deep. 
And Jenny, age seven, says, there are two kinds of love, God's love, our love, but God makes both kinds. That's also deep. That last answer, in fact, is worthy of a philosopher or a theologian, for sure. Maybe we should listen to children more than we do. They see the world around them with clear, fresh eyes and interpret it with clear, fresh minds. Children may be able to help us understand love better and more deeply than we could by ourselves. I think the fact that God commands us to love him tells us something about the kind of love God is demanding. It is not just a feeling, because you cannot command a feeling. It is a commitment. It is a surrender. It is a willingness to give everything you are to everything God is. Think about that statement. It's a commitment and a willingness to give everything you are to everything God is. Think about how important your love for God really is. Is it important in your life? Do you feel like it's important? In your own life, have you ever thought about the fact that your love is the one thing that God can't take from you? It's the one thing God can't take from you. Love is the only thing he can have if you voluntarily give it to him, right? He can take your money. He can take everything else, in fact. He can take your money. He can take your house. He can take your car. He can take your loved ones. He can even take your life on earth. However, he can't take your love. You must give him your love. There is still one other dimension to this commandment that Jesus is talking about that we haven't yet touched on, which is the horizontal dimension, right? What do I mean by that? The cross of Christ is both vertical and horizontal, right? Love God is definitely vertical between us and God. And love others is definitely horizontal between us and others. Jesus goes on to say this, the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. All of the law and the prophets. By themselves, there's nothing at all unique about these two commandments, to love God and love your neighbor, right? However, what is unique is this is the first time in Scripture anyone has joined these two together. It's the first time. Jesus, in effect, is saying, if you have vertical love for God that you ought to have, then you can't help but to have love for others that you ought to have. They are connected as God's vision. Here's a strong plug for our midweek meals with a message. Some would say a shameless plug, but I won't say that. It's a strong plug. One of the greatest ways, one of the greatest ways that any church brings people together so they can love each other is through groups that meet together. Any kinds of groups, all kinds of groups. And I'm talking about any groups that meet, not just Bible studies. These are groups where life and love come together. All churches do groups in many ways, including here at VPC. There's small groups, there's children and youth groups, there's book groups, there's life groups, there's scouts and community groups. There's no end to how groups are set up and organized in any church. Our midweek groups here at VPC meet on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. for dinner as a large group and then for discussion as smaller groups. The focus of groups, though, first and foremost, is bringing people together as community. No matter if it's for a meal, no matter if it's for conversation, fellowship, 
Bible study, discussion. It's for all of those things. And it's within a community of faith, usually. That's where God's love is shown, and that's where love for others is shown and demonstrated. Our adult core discipleship group is a community of people within this community of faith. Last week, we had 22 adults in that community. The most important thing about last week is not the number, but the fact that we were all discussing God's word in our own lives. You and I can study the Bible on our own, right? You all have Bibles. We all have Bibles. You can study it by yourself, and you should, right? But you and I can study on our own. We can pray on our own. We can even worship on our own. But when you and I become Christ followers, one of the most amazing amazing things we become part of is the body of Christ or the church. And the church is a community of other Christ followers and there's something special and different and important about praying, studying the word and worshiping not just by ourselves but with other people like you're doing right now. That community, that group, that body of Christ is going to keep your and my faith alive and growing. Now, these are things that you already know. I realize that. You already know everything I've just said. But it strengthens us to be reminded of how groups allow us to love other people and follow Jesus' greatest commandment. I happen to believe that this body of Christ and every body of Christ, which means every church, functions better and more effectively together than as separate disciples in this world. Do you believe that? I believe that. Put another way, being together as the church is vital to being a disciple of Christ. It's vital. How are we to love our neighbor as ourself if we're never connecting with our neighbor? That's impossible. Doesn't make any sense. However, in this world out there, there are movements and people in our culture today that want to separate themselves from the organization of any church. They'll say they don't like the tradition or the organization or the rules or the politics or whatever they don't like. So they're not going to become part of that. And sometimes they have a point. They point out weaknesses of any organization. But even so, they're not right because that goes against the model for ministry and discipleship that Jesus gave us and gives us. It goes against it directly. Someone who is a true follower of Christ is going to want to be with other Christ followers. You can't help it. You can fight it, but you can't help it. They're going to need to be with other Christ followers. Finally, let me close with this analogy for the body of Christ and for God's vision for us as disciples of his. Think about a barbecue grill, right? That season is coming to an end, maybe, for some of us. Not for me either, Aaron. I, I, I do that all winter long. But a barbecue grill, and I'm talking old school, has a pile of charcoal briquettes in the bottom of it, right? I'm not talking about the... Um, gas grills of today, you light that grill and that charcoal gets hot, right? And keeps on putting out a nice even heat for a long time. You may spread out the coals a little bit, but they're still all together and they all turn gray together. There's an analogy for getting older. (laughs) They all turn gray together. I just thought of that. (laughs) Anyway, now... What happens when you take one of those coals out of that grill and put it down on the cement, or you don't want to put it down on your, on your deck, but down on the ground, okay? What happens when you separate it 
from the other pieces of burning charcoal. It grows cold pretty fast, right? Quickly, and it dies. This is how the body of Christ functions. And it's a good analogy, not perfect, but it's a good analogy for, for how when we are together, our hearts burn within us for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it gives light and heat to the world around us when we're together. The burning in our hearts will grow cold when we are separated and alone. The light and the heat is not as great. It's still there, but it's not as great. That burning in our hearts will grow cold and will die if we remain separated. Thanks be to God and the vision of faith for each one of us. Amen and amen. Today in our prayer time, we want to lift up people, places, circumstances that are on our hearts and minds. That doesn't work. So what's on your hearts and minds? Bill. If you mention Green Bay and New York, I'm going to shut that microphone off. <laughs> Just a warning. I'm having another knee replacement uh, next Tuesday. First for a successful surgery and quick recovery. Tuesday, right? Anyone else? Crystal. Aaron's mom, Sue, is having shoulder surgery this week sometime. Prayers for Sue in this surgery. Nancy. I have a joy. I don't want to yell. Um, Doris Shaper's birthday is tomorrow. She'll be 93. Well, we have to sing. Sorry, Doris, but we have to sing. Tag. Um, she's got another kidney infection, um, and it's just been a really rough year for her in all that's been going on, and she called me crying the other day, so you just keep her in your prayers mainly for, like, you know, what goes on with your brain as you get older and can't beat infections, and she has to be cared for by my sister, so that just, you know, there's... There's five kids, like, in the house with my mom. Is she at home? Yeah. She's at home, praise the Lord. She does not want to be in the nursing home, but with the infection, that, you know, could mean a pick line goes back in, and then she'll have to be in the nursing care facility for that. And she doesn't want that, but either which way, it's just prayers her way, please. What's her name? Anyone else? Linda. Yes, I want to ask for prayers for um, Margaret Troutman. That's Ken's mother. She's in the nursing home, and she recently um, fell again, and not sure I understand all the complications, but smashed her arm, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, she's in a lot of pain, and um, just, prayer for her having she in the hospital she's in a nursing home so I don't 
I don't okay. think she went to the hospital. I don't. They may take her to the hospital. It just recently happened, so okay. we don't have as much detail. But it's very painful and very disheartening. So prayers for her, please. Thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer with all of our prayers. Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful ways in which you have healed and restored us. There have been countless times when we wondered if the trials and struggles of our lives would overcome us and swallow us up, yet you have reached out to redeem us time and time again. Just as in the scriptures, when Jesus healed the ten people afflicted with leprosy, one when he saw that he had been healed, returned to Christ, praising God for the healing that had taken place in him. Make our faith as strong as the one of that person. Give us the wisdom to know the source of healing is not in our pleading, but in our acknowledging your love and your power. As we bring before you the names and situations in our hearts and the people that are filled with strife, challenge, trouble, pain. We ask for their healing as well. We know that you hear the cries of our hearts and respond always in love. Help us to place our complete trust in your never-ending compassion and your powerful healing by the Holy Spirit. Almighty Creator, you have molded and shaped us in your image, and yet we do not understand you completely. We seek you, but we fail to comprehend how wonderful and awe-inspiring you are and the world you have made. Far too often we make you in our own image, distorting who you really are and trying to shape you into who we want you to be but you are the almighty God most high and cannot be contained. Great creator, instead we pray you might mold us and shape us into who you need us to be. Mold and shape our hearts to be full of your love for the world. Lead us into your ways to grow in wisdom and insight on this journey of faith and help us to grow in our love for you each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ, you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. So hear now our prayers for the church, the body of Christ in this world, that it would be strong and faithful and righteous in this world. For this congregation, its mission and ministry that it would be close to you and listening to your voice and responding in love for you and love for others. For the healing of the earth, for the peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all those of your people who need healing. Lord God, you've heard our prayers this day specifically. So we lift those all up to you and trust that you will provide for both the joys and the concerns. We trust that you will strengthen the people involved, the needs that are there, the challenges that they face, all in the process of bringing you closer to them and bringing them closer to you. Lord God, we ask and we pray all of these prayers in the strong name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray to say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in Luke 17, when the leper ran back to thank Jesus for healing, 
for new life and for fresh possibilities, Jesus was amazed and moved that a Samaritan would come to a Jew and give heartfelt thanks. Jesus sent this man on his way with blessings that made the man whole again through and through in his entire life. We too have known the healing and saving God in our lives in many, many ways. And we will know this God yet again. So let our offering today be our thanksgiving for the mercy and the goodness and the faithfulness of God that lasts forever. Thank you for your faith commitment for this body of Christ, through this body of Christ, and in this body of Christ. Please continue to make that faith commitment and give to God as your heart directs you. So let's bless and ask for God's blessing on our gifts today. Gracious and loving God, we bring you our gifts this day, dedicating them in your name so that all would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord God, use these gifts, whether they're here, across the world, or across the street. Help them to be used for spreading the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to die and was raised for the forgiveness of all sins and all people. Lord God, in this process of giving and receiving, draw us all closer to each other and closer to you. For we want to love God, love you, and we want to love each other unconditionally. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join me in singing our closing hymn, For the Life That You Have Given. According to his power that is at work within us, be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord and Savior, throughout all generations. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.